Turn, turn on your microphone. Straight on. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, rainy night. I'm glad everybody came out. Uh, our Squirrel Hill Historical Society wants to welcome everybody, all the members and guests, and our Zoom members, and our Zoom guests, to our uh, Zoom program. Uh, this program is being recorded, uh, and we will be uploading it on our Squirrel Hill uh, History.org website. Uh, we have about 200 programs and videos and events on, our, on the website. Um, anybody can log into that and see what's going on and watch the videos. All of our newsletters uh, are password protected for members only. So if you want to read our newsletters and you're not a member, it's only 15 bucks for a single and 25 for a couple to uh, join Squirrel Hill Historical Society. And that can be done right on the website. Okay, uh, I am Jim Hammond, I'm the board president. Uh, let's see who's here, Helen Wilson, our vice president, newsletter editor, researcher, does about everything. And then Tony Navita is right here. He's our email coordinator, researcher, and also president of the uh, Friends of the News Log House. Uh, we got Toby Chapman and Todd Miller. They're both here. They're our program coordinators. Stanley Klein, I don't see him, but he's our membership coordinator. Evelyn Young is our treasurer. She's not here tonight. Audrey Glickman. Back here. Back here. She's our media, media specialist and she records all our programs and gets them uploaded. Wayne Bossinger is here. He's a researcher now. And uh, Charles Sukap, he's not here. He's another researcher. Yeah, he's he is here. Oh, there you are. Okay. And Todd Wilson is here. He's our researcher and also going to be a speaker. And Dr. Jean Binstock cannot make it tonight. I talked to her. Uh, she generally works the information table. So, um, it's been like 10 days of this news coverage on the trial, of the uh, Tree of Life trial, and our Squirrel Hill Historical Society wants to share our sympathy and support of all the Tree of Life congregation and the Squirrel Hill community during this awful and stressful time, and hopefully things will get over pretty quick. All right, some other news coming up. Uh, or we had our um, at Beth Shalom. A lot of people went to the stained glass program. That was just magnificent. Uh, there were about 50 people there, and uh, Barb uh, Onik uh, is an authority on the windows, and she um, we hopefully write, will write a book. We're trying. To, everybody was talking to her about it. She has like 25 years researching all these windows, and. Uh, and all that knowledge that has to be put down in, in writing. So everybody knows her, work on her to get the book written, at least get it started. And Audrey did record the uh, program and it will be uploaded to our site. So everybody that didn't see it can see it. But not and yet. There's a lot of history there. And it was just amazing all the stories of, of those windows. It's just unbelievable. Uh, next thing coming up, uh, the uh, first Squirrel Hill Night Market is going to be on June 24th from 6 to 10. And it looks like they got about 70 uh, I Make It booths there in a band and of course a lot of food. So that would be a fun time. And on our uh, Squirrel Hill Historical Society, we're going to continue to send out information on the uh, Irish Center Project to keep all the parties informed. Uh, we're not taking a stand pro or con. Uh, we're just doing history on the Nine Mile Run Valley and the Irish Center property. Uh, there will be some more stories in our, um, in our newsletters. And I think Helen's going to write a few of those, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, now we're going to have uh, Tony's going to give an update on the Friends of the Neil Log House. And he finishes that. Helen uh, is going to introduce our uh, speaker, who she knows pretty well. 
<laughs> and, uh, and she may have some other thoughts also. And uh, following the Q&A period, um, Todd Miller will come up and give the, uh, talk about the next programs we're going to have. Okay, that's all I have. Can, can I ask a question sure. about the Hour Center thing? On which Hour Center? The Hour Center. Yes. Development. Proposed development. What about it? My question is, is it still up for debate or is it already a done deal between the developers and the city? We are, we are just spinning our wheels. Uh, I hope not. Can I answer that? Yeah, go ahead, Tony. Uh, it depends entirely on whether they get the variance to the uh, park designation that the land is presently under. They have to get an exception for usage to right. go from two stories to eight stories, or three stories to eight stories. That, that will be brought up at a, uh, do we have the date in July that the zoning July board? 6th. July 6th, yes. July 6th zoning is the public on, on zoning online. board hearing. And you can go online and there, there's a way that you can communicate by email and supposedly by Zoom, I guess, during the meeting and participate. Yeah. Voice your opinion. No, we have sent out that information. We hope so. That's, that's the public <laughs> process that it's supposed to go through. Yeah. And you, see, you um, can also go to Upstream Pittsburgh. Um, they have information. Um, but um, all we know is that the zoning hearing is July 6th, and it is on Zoom. So, anyway. Okay. Uh, Jim asked me to say a few words, and it's, it's very easy to give you a progress update now. It's um, hard to believe that it's been less than two years since we've been incorporated. And today we finally received the final draft of the contract with the contractor who's vetted by the city to reconstruct the log house this summer. Uh, I'm very pleased to announce that uh, we have a start date of August 24th, no later than the end of August. Uh, we're going to have a celebration of a log hewing on August 5th, and you're all going to get a lot more information on that. Uh, but we're, we're moving along at warp speed at the same time. Uh, Marty Eisner received another, incidentally, all this is uh, paid for by private donations. Uh, uh, the Pennsylvania uh, Department of uh, Community and Economic Development, a large public grant, will take care of the reconstruction. Uh, Marty just received another grant that will take care of uh, the educational programming, the employment of interns. We have a uh, a graduate history intern from CMU and an interactive media intern from Chatham University coming on board this fall uh, to work with us on programming. Programming is what it's all about, opening the log house to the public, uh, having a variety of uh, educational programs, and we're going to begin laying a sound foundation for that at the same time that uh, the roof's being replaced, the floor, eight logs, so come and see the one being hewed on August 5th. Yeah. Helen, you want to be next? Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the presentation tonight. Um, um, Okay, before I introduce our speaker, I have just two, two announcements. Uh, first, I've talked about um, putting the Squirrel Hill Historical Society's photographs on Historic Pittsburgh. HistoricPittsburgh.com, if you haven't gone to it, that's for all things Pittsburgh history. It's got maps, pictures, directories, um, text, full text. So our, our collection, I've already um, given them 60 photos. And they don't have to be from the t 10s and 20s and 30s. I have some from 2002. Because they said, but that's history. It will be history going forward. So um, if you have scenes of Squirrel Hill, if you give me the photographs, I have to scan them a certain way, and you'll get the photographs back. So, um, and um, um, it's, it, they're going to go live with our, um, our section, our Squirrel Hill Historical Society section, uh, soon. They said it's soon, so that'll be great. Okay, and the second thing, um, just wanted to say that Todd, 
our speaker. Um, he is one of the tour guides for Doors Open Pittsburgh's boat tours this summer uh, on all three rivers. And the tour last month was phenomenal. We went down the, Ele at the Ohio River, saw Elkisan, saw Western Penn, um, learned a lot about Bruno's Island. So um, they're really wonderful tours. And the next one coming up is June 24th, and we're going up the Allegheny River. Um, it's called History and Mysteries of the Allegheny River. And it's the first Allegheny River tour that's planned to go past Washington's Crossing Island. So that's the first. So, and you can go to Doors Open PGH to register. And I do have flyers on the back information table if you want to, to, to know more about the tours. Okay, so that brings me to introducing our speaker. <laughs> Um, Todd Wilson is a Squirrel Hill Historical Society board member and it is a, an, an award-winning professional engineer in Pittsburgh. He's been photographing and writing about bridges his whole life. I know that because he's my son and uh, <laughs> I can tell you he's been interested in bridges since kindergarten. Since then he's photographed bridges in all 50 states and over 30 countries. Todd graduated from Carnegie Mellon University with a double major in civil engineering and engineering and public policy, and he received an MBA from Point Park University. He now works as a traffic engineer at a local civil engineering company. He serves as a trustee of Pittsburgh History and Landmarks, Foundation, Landmarks Foundation's Landmarks Development Corporation, and is active in other Pittsburgh civic organizations. He co-wrote Pittsburgh's Bridges, which was published by Arcadia, and Engineer in Pittsburgh, published by the History Press. So, here he is to talk about the history of something much closer, the Fern Hollow Bridges. Well, thank you so much, and thanks for coming out on such a wonderful uh, rainy night. You know, the last time it rained was on the Doors Open tour on the Ohio River. So it's, I guess uh, any time that we're speaking this year, it's going to be rainy. But let's, let's hope the Allegheny tour has a, you know, more success. So I've been giving a lot of various bridge presentations since the uh, Pittsburgh Bridge book came out in 2015. And this is the first time since then that I had to create an entirely new presentation from scratch. So for anyone who's come to a previous presentation, there's, there's no repeats whatsoever. So I'm pretty excited about that. And before I begin, too, again, since this is a new presentation, I do want to acknowledge everybody who has helped with research and documentation for information um, in this presentation. So thank you to Helen. Thank you to Charles. Um, thank you to Lauren Winkler for helping me with a lot of the research. Even the Squirrel Hill Histori you know, the History of Squirrel Hill book, Wayne's chapter, was very helpful on the history of Fern Hollow as well and the various newsletters. So I apologize if I don't thank you by name, but again, thank you to the entire Squirrel Hill Historical Society. And with that, um, if, um, not long after the Fern Hollow Bridge collapsed, uh, Todd had mentioned, well, you'd give a presentation about the Fern Hollow Bridge and about its collapse. Now, I want to clarify that I'm a traffic engineer, so I work on road projects and bridge projects and how they are tied together. But I'm not a bridge engineer, so I'm not doing the structural design and structural calculations itself. So while I definitely have maybe an educated guess about some of the things that have happened, I don't have the definitive knowledge and I have not been involved with this bridge and I have not been involved with the investigation at all. So, therefore, he said that we'll focus more on the rich history of Fern Hollow itself and we'll give a historical context for these bridges. And then we'll have a discussion that will limit to the historical context. Then at the end, I'll sh I can show you some photos from my personal collection, just being a, you know, a park user and going and watching the bus lift. And, uh, and then we'll, we can talk about that. So with that, um, so the bridges over Fern Hollow. So first I'll give a brief history of Fern Hollow, which, you know, since Frick Park was not established until 1919 and wasn't opened until 1927, and really wasn't developed until the 1930s, we know of 
that area is part of Frick Park, but really Frick Park is part of Fern Hollow. So, so keep that in mind. So Fern Hollow became the, uh, the, it was the common term for that entire area. Then I'll give a bit brief history on the roads, streetcars, and rails through the valley and through the area. And that's really the important context that explains the higher bridges, and then the Frick Park context, which explains the lower bridges. Then I'll just go by one by one. We'll highlight the Fern Hollow bridges, and then we'll have a discussion about the historical settings and the, of the bridges over the valley. And then I'll share some uh, images about more recent developments. So, while I never assume that everybody knows uh, every single location, so I want to. So to be clear, here's a map of Frick Park, and in this, the uh, red circle is the part that we consider Fern Hollow, so the branch from Nine Mile Run. The blue, um, this blue line here represents what is Nine Mile Run, and the red line represents what is Fern Hollow Creek. So, so we'll be focusing mainly on the bridges over the red line, though I will mention the, the two other major bridges over uh, Nine Mile Run. So the early history of the valley. So Fern Hollow would really remained largely undeveloped because it was further away, um, you know, as Squirrel Hill itself was later to develop. The flatlands tend to develop first, the lines along the railroad, maybe the river valleys that pointed in the direction of downtown. So Fer Fern Hollow was none of them, so it developed later. So, I mean, it, you know, there was great Native American hunting grounds. Um, there was a lot of salt, and there was a salt lick, and deer were attracted to the salt licks, so it was a good, good hunting grounds. Then you had light industry, sawmills, grist mills, the typical industry for um, a valley, some scattered farms. And then, um, in t towards the turn of the century, became, you know, well drilling actually became a pretty common activity where I mentioned the salt licks, so there were brine wells in the valley, and the end of Nine, nine Mile Run itself was a salt works, so Lean Street owes its name to that. And then um, gas, you know, where there's salt, there may be gas. So the Fern Hollow Gas and Oil Company was formed, and there were various gas wells in the valley, and you can see, you can find some areas where those wells are capped today. And there was even a mineral water production facility in the valley. So you can see um, these various maps, you can see things like mineral springs, Fern Hollow Gas and Oil, Quarry, Coal Bank, as well as the farms, and um, even the Homewood Mansion um, was here. This is Dallas Avenue right there. So, so then, um, as, so let's, let's Turn back to 1862. So here's a, an interesting older map. And just to highlight, here is Nine Mile Run on the map. And here is Fern Hollow Creek. Some of the earlier roads that went through the general area, you had Bradock Avenue, um, which kind of paralleled the valley on the hilltop. So more development was along the ridge lines and the flatlands than um, you know, deeper into the valley. Now, it did connect through like Whipple and Homestead Streets in uh, Swiss Elm Park, and then there was a connection to the Monongahela River with a ferry at City Farm Station. One of the oldest roads in the area in the Squirrel Hill side is Shady Avenue, which needs no introduction, and Forward Avenue was one of the first roads that kind of penetrated through the valley from Shady over. Forbes Avenue at this time really did not go past the valley. So Forbes was a little bit of a later road, with Penn Avenue and Wilkinsburg really being the main east-west road through the area. Now, now, we talk about Fern Hollow. Well, where does Fern Hollow begin, right? Where does Fern Hollow Creek begin? And um, the answer is it began right around the intersection of Beechwood, Linden, and Wilkins, um, where there were ice ponds. So, and there's several different streams started in this general area, so they became the ideal setting for, or the natural setting, I should say, you know, the, the streams that started with the ponds before we drained everything. And um, various, uh, you know, um, business owners uh, got into the ice business. And so these ice ponds really generally disappeared right around the turn of the century. 
So if you look at an old map, you can see here's an ice house right here with Linden Avenue, so Beechwood would be here. So you can see ice ponds along Wilkins, and then the stream coming along Dallas, past where St. Bede's Church is now, past the original location for Sterrett um, Classical Academy, so that's the, the uh, circle by, uh, um, no, it's a, this is where the Frick Gate House is today. And again, there are the ice houses, or the ice ponds, and there's the old location of Sterrett. And if we look today, you can see this whole part of the valley is pretty much gone. It's all been drained. It's all been developed. And just as context, it's overlaying the old maps with the modern street grid. You can kind of see the transition. You can really see how along the Wilkins Avenue Valley, the start of the Fern Hall, Fern Hollow, <laughs> the start of Fern Hollow, where those ponds were, and just how the stream fits together. And you'll see this in other maps, but this is the current location of Starrett, and that's the gatehouse. Now, like I mentioned, that Fern Hollow was slow to develop due to the lack of transportation. So you really, it really didn't, development in this area really didn't start happening until the electric streetcar was invented in the late 1880s. So then in the early 1890s is when this area started to be developed for streetcars, like the first Squirrel Hill streetcar was in the early 1890s. So it wasn't until 1900 that an ordinance was passed for the Wilkinsburg and East Pittsburgh Street Railway Company to get the charter to bridge Fern Hollow. So it included realigning Forbes Avenue, building the bridge across Fern Hollow, and the initial route went along Braddock Avenue to the Rankin Bridge, to, you know, to Kennywood, which was open at the time, because Kennywood opened in, 18, it was built in 1898 and opened in 1899. And then, and the second route went straight at the end of the bridge to Wilkinsburg, and then it could connect to the East Pittsburgh line. So what's interesting about, you know, so here's an older map, and this is the old alignment of Forbes Avenue going into Fern Hollow. And as you can, as time went on, and the streetcar was developed, now you can see Forbes, Forbes Street, and look, the old alignment of Forbes is Beechwood <coughs> Boulevard. If you wonder why the streets are so close together. So we'll zoom in. So here's the old alignment of Forbes. So here's the intersection of Forbes and Dallas. And today, you can see how Forbes, that Beechwood is the, that old alignment of Forbes, when Forbes was realigned for the streetcar. So if you ever wonder, why are these two roads so close together? Just like with most things in Pittsburgh, when you peel back the layers of history, you can find the answer. Now, interestingly, on the other side of the valley, Forbes originally went through the valley and came back up. And there's no evidence that the park through the valley was ever paved. It probably wasn't even a bridge over Fern Hollow, uh, Fern Hollow Creek. But when Forbes was realigned, which you can see here, they built the bridge. And you can see, this is Forbes, so the part with the Fern Hollow Bridge is actually Forbes Street Extension, where this road right here still retains, is the old alignment of Forbes Avenue. If anybody knows what that street is, today it is known as Rosemary, it was Rosemary Road. And uh, Helen used to live on Rosemary Road at one point, before she moved to Squirrel Hill. And was one of the first people to walk on the uh, old Fern Hollow Bridge before it was completed. <laughs> so this is the, uh, the streetcar map that I mentioned, where the orange is the streetcar line that was built, was designated and built with the Fern Hollow Bridge, and the purple being the extension to Wilkinsburg. So you can see how this fits in with the regional context, with the gray being just a few of the main streetcar lines that have existed in the era. So, you know, from a Squirrel Hill context, it's interesting to think that really the original streetcars turned for, um, from Forbes to Murray. In fact, the original alignment was on Northumberland to Murray, and then when it was realigned, it was Forbes to Murray, and then Forbes became the logical extension. So just a few notes about how, the, uh, how important streetcars were to developing this area that some of the finest property in Squirrel Hill lies beyond Murray Avenue. So to reach it, this new line has been planned. That this new line will reduce the present streetcar time to Wilkinsburg by 10 minutes, 
and bring the outlying districts of Squirrel Hill within 30 minutes ride to downtown. One of the interesting things, and one of the really important things, is that this new route um, got rid of grade crossings, so therefore the streetcars could move without having to cross railroad tracks. And here's an interesting note. With the opening of the two new lines, a new pleasure resort will make its appearance in Wilkinsburg, and a casino of extensive and attractive proportions will be built. The new building will be located somewhere at the lower end of Fern Hollow. So, unfortunately, that casino is never built, but it's interesting to think about the imaginations that developers had even back then for Fern Hollow, as soon as the uh, streetcars were installed. Another idea for Fern Hollow was for it to be a, tr a railroad route, a heavy rail route. So, in 1903, the B&O Railroad announced the plans to build their new route through Fern Hollow, to connect to the brilliant branch of the Pennsylvania Railroad, which was just built. So the PO, Pennsylvania Railroad lines are in gray. The brilliant branch that was just built was, is in um, magenta here. And that line was kind of the eastern bypass for downtown Pittsburgh, so Pennsylvania Railroad trains could use it to go along the Allegheny River. The b and Railroad and their Connellsville Railroad um, partner owned the line along the Monongahela River, as well as the Pittsburgh Junction Railroad. So when you look on a map, it seems very obvious why you would, the B&O would be interested in connecting right to the, to the brilliant branch. But there's a long history of the competition and not cooperation between the lines, plus Homewood Cemetery in the valley, plus the Henry Frick owning a nice portion of the valley. So there were a lot of complications, so this line was never built. So instead, what happened was Frick Park. So in 1908, Helen Clay Frick, that's not her, that's a different Helen, right? <laughs> um, Helen Clay Frick, at her debut, supposedly asked her father if someday the family estate could be the undeveloped woodlands, so kids growing up here could have the same experience enjoying the woods as she did. Um, then in 1910, Frederick Law Olmsted, he wrote the, uh, he was retained by the city's new planning commission when, because at the time the city merged with Allegheny City, so the government was reorganized. And he recommended, among other things, that the Nine Mile, mile Run Valley would be developed into a park. With the long meadows of varying widths would make ideal play fields. The stream, when it is freed, with, by, freed from sewage, would be an attractive and investing element in the landscape. And, um, so his idea was really to capture this wooden oasis um, as a park. However, then Mayor McGee won election and was not interested. But, wow, well, we skipped three slides. <laughs> so, but here's the timeline of Frick Park and how it ended up happening. In that, in 1915, uh, Henry Clay Frick bequeathed the park, and it was established in 1919 upon his death. Um, 1923, Part of the valley was purchased, that he didn't own, was purchased. The lower Nine Mile Run part was purchased by Duquesne Slag. And that became you know, the, uh, the Slag Dump, which is now a Somerset at Frick Park. 1923, for the upper part of the valley, the city accepted the deed. 1927 is when Frick Park technically opened, but when it opened, nothing was developed. So then from 1927 to 1935, they hired a landscape architect firm, Bloom Weldon and Company, and they developed the park. The fir very first trail in the park connected the Bowling Green by the Frick Estate to Beechwood Boulevard by the Nature Center. From in the early 1930s, John Russell Pope um, designed the first, the, the four Frick, the beautiful stone Frick Park um, gateways. Also about this time, through the Great Depression recovery, the Works Progress Administration started funding the improvements to the park, which is why so much of the character of the park has the, you know, the stone character similar to Shenley, similar to other Works Progress Administration projects at the time. And that funding lasted until 1942. And then um, a new landscape architecture firm, Innocenti and Webble, um, worked with the park and master planned the park from 1935 to 1957. So most of the park bridges were built you know, all within this period. 
Also want to note that the Blue Slide Playground area, that was the Pittsburgh Country Club, that wasn't purchased until 1936. If you look at a map, you can still see the remnants of the, uh, the greens and the, the golf course that was there. And it wasn't until 1942 that most of the trail system of the park um, was um, completed. And it wasn't until 1996 that finally, after Duquesne Slag left, the lower part of the park, um, the, 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 you know, the lower part of Nine Mile Run was incorporated into the park. So really, most of Frick Park is synonymous, synonymous with Fern Hollow. And one of the things that, you know, I, I used, to, when growing up, I used to go to Frick Park every day. And one of the things that I think we all love about Frick Park is just how you forget that you're in the city. It's not like Shenley Park where you have to cross a road, or Highland Park where you drive through the park. So, a few really interesting lines coming up through the research is that the primary attraction of the park really is the landscape itself. A carefully cultivated wilderness with vehicular access and active recreational facilities kept to its perimeter. So think about it with Frick Park. You have the opportunity to go to a playground, go to a tennis court that's conveniently near the road, but then you can go further into the park and forget that you're in the city entirely. So Supervisor Harvey Crass in 1929 said, we want to keep the park just as natural and wild as we possibly can. And the National Register nomination form noted, this was interesting in 1949, the city wanted to, to utilize 20 acres, because they were convenient and available, for the Civic Light Opera. Um, in the Riverview area, which would be the area um, past the Blue Slide Playground. And, but the landscape architecture firm of the park opposed it, because developing part of the park like that would be contrary to the spirit and the intent, intent of the original bequest of Frick Park. So with that, you know, that's kind of how these, you know, kind of the story of why the road bridges and why the park bridges were built and what they look like. So you can categorize the bridges into the high-level roadway bridges above the park, the small trail culverts within the park, with the stone ones being developed through Works Progress Administration funding, and the bridges on the roadways that border the park, which are smaller. And Commercial Street, because that was the historic boundary of the park, that also counts as a park border. So from north to south, this map of all of the red dots are all of the bridges that I'll cover within the park. First one is the Homewood Avenue Bridge by Sterrett and by the Frick Park Gatehouse. Um, are you familiar with this bridge? Because if you look in the map, it says right here, Stone Bridge. And this is Sterrett, this is the current location of Sterrett. In fact, this is the location, and then here's where the Sterrett the field is behind it. This is Homewood Cemetery over here. So what stone bridge is there? If you look at the map today, you can see a road, but no bridge. This is the view today, where you can see a, a fence, and the, here's the entrance to Homewood Cemetery, and here's a park trail along the fence. Underneath there, supposedly, is a bridge. So, what happened to the bridge? Well, while the valley was filled in, a source mentioned that some of the stones along the bridge parapets were reused when they lowered Grants Hill and were applied to the courthouse. So I went all around the courthouse and went all around the jail and found this one area where these, uh, this masonry looks like bridge ashlar. It does not match the rest of the courthouse area. So while I can't prove that it's true, this is the only spot along the courthouse and jail that looks like it came from a bridge, and it certainly does. So maybe there is part of that bridge visible today. Next into the park, um, there's a small culvert along the Homewood Trail, and this would be probably the only original, this was the, the, this was the only bridge on the original path through the park. So whether or not there was, this was the original bridge, or if there was, a, say, a wooden footbridge and this was replaced in the 1930s, no, I'm not sure, but this bridge would have been, this trail would have been established maybe about 1928. And this is very sensitive. All right, so next we'll talk about the original Fern Hollow Bridge. Like I mentioned, it was completed for streetcars. That was 1901 by the Schultz Bridge and Iron Works. Schultz was the same company that did the Brady Street Bridge, as well as 
the Panther Hollow Bridge and the Shenley Bridge. So they have experience designing bridges um, in our parks. And that bridge was, had a 195 foot long arch and it was uh, varied between 60 to 125 feet above the valley below. Now Forbes Avenue wasn't paved until 1925 which led to the bridge needing to be repaired in 1929 as everything was being upgraded to you know, the heavy traffic volumes that followed. And the bridge lasted until 1972. So that's what the original bridge looked like. Um, I, hopefully, I wish I would remember it, hopefully some of you may. And notice how you know, the decorative railings and the arch-like structure, which again was you know, in the city of Pittsburgh, you built, say, a trestle-like bridge if you didn't care what was in the valley below and you build an arch bridge if the valley below wanted to be a park, or if you thought the valley below might become a park. So, I don't have a picture, but if you compare this to the Murray Avenue, the original Murray Avenue bridge, that was an example of you know, the trestle type structure with supports throughout the valley. So here are some pictures over the years. Uh, car frustrated with the traffic congestion. The bridge was only three lanes wide instead of four, so he tried driving on the sidewalk. <laughs> and here, right, right up against the uh, railings there, and then here's a picture from uh, around 1970, the old streetcar tracks, you can see the potholes, and the overall you know, deterioration of the bridge. So it was demolished in 1972, there was a construction accident where one worker did fall, and here's some just images of bridge demolition. Out with the old, in with the new in 1973. So the project was finished, it was designed in 1971. Construction began in 1972, and it was supposed to be finished in a few months in November of that year. Well, apparently now in modern times, we can do the whole project start to finish in less time than it took them to build, you know, the year and a half it took them to build the previous Fern Hollow Bridge with problems securing the self-weathering core 10 steel. So that's that rusty steel like in the, like the steel building downtown, where the, the intent is that the steel oxidizes so it, so it self-rusts, and that rust forms a weatherproof patina. Unfortunately, that patina generally needs to be dry for it to be effective. Um, also, it issues with unions, wet weather, and the Squirrel Hill Merchants Association was not happy at the delays in building this bridge. Um, they were so worried that when cars can't get to Squirrel Hill, traffic will just, you know, business will go elsewhere. So there was, there was a lot of articles about the upset Squirrel Hill merchants. But here it's coming Friday, and here's what the bridge looked like in 1972 when they were just putting the railings on and just finishing up the structure. So the bridge opened June 1st, 1973, about 450 feet long. Um, Richardson Gordon Associates was the company that built just about every major bridge in Pittsburgh at that time. And if, you're, if any of you have watched Rick Seaback's uh, Flying Off the Bridge to Nowhere, you have extensive um, interviewing with Art Hedgren in that video. In fact, I believe I recall that Art Hedgren was the one to, to, to uh, have been involved with the Glenfield Bridge that cracked. And he said that, well, thankfully, you know, we went back to the office and it wasn't, it wasn't our fault. <laughs> and it was a problem with welding. And to be fair, it was probably not a design issue with this bridge, um, or at least a, what would be considered a design issue back then with the bridge. So hopefully the uh, integrity, you know, he designed other bridges that were similar, so hopefully the, in the integrity of his work, let's, let's hope is sound. And um, the bridge is an example of rigid K-frame design, and it was built in the 1970s for 1.2 million. And in 1974, it won a prize from the American Institute of Steel Construction. Um, this very handsome bridge blends well into its rustic setting. The sloping piers and their relationship to the hillsides give the entire structure a sense of logic and beauty. Now, the 1970s were not really a time that you know, we consider um, of where architects and engineers cared about the appearance of structures, maybe. But this bridge was intentionally designed. Even though it wasn't an arch, still that frame structure maintained the original intent and it was specifically designed to blend well in with the park. And then, as we know, January 28th, 2022, it collapsed. <laughs> Five bridges were on the bridge and then one vehicle drove off the abutment 
onto the bridge. And the current bridge was designed by HDR, which is the legacy of the, Richard, the company that bought Richardson Gordon. And um, it was built for $25 million, three-span concrete bridge, 150-foot-long concrete beam, beams. And what's most noted is just how quickly the bridge was built. I mean, it was reopened in less than a year. This type of project should take five years plus. Um, so from this construction began on May 9th, and by December 21st, some of you, I know I did, drove across it, and it's now currently closed for them to put the finishing touches on it. So, so going down, going through the valley, next we have an original stone culvert to um, a shelter. Now bridges like this would have a concrete arch ring, and this, the stonework was just facing the uh, bridge to make it look like a stone arch. So you can see how the concrete arch ring is exposed. In fact, here's an example of what that concrete arch ring looks like, where this picture is, I don't know, 10 or 15 years old. And this was when they replaced the uh, Biddle Trail Bridge. Um, once they removed the stone, they initially had set aside the arch ring. And today, this is what the uh, Biddle Trail Bridge looks like. Then a spur trail was added to the Biddle Trail, another wooden bridge built at the same time, so this would have been 10 to 20 years ago. Perhaps the nicest pathway bridge is the Falls Ravine Trail Bridge, a similar design, but you know, two arches. Unfortunately, I just went this weekend and noticed some deterioration. Again, it's not structural because it's not the concrete arch ring itself, but still hope that something like this is addressed sooner rather than later. Then you have a split and, you know, spur trail to the parking lot on Falls Ravine Trail. Here's what the entrance looks like to the one parking lot that penetrates the valley um, from Hutch the, Hutchison and the historical name, the Hutchison Entrance. So it is a precast concrete arch culvert. And then next, Fern Hollow um, Creek goes into the sewer that was authorized in 1931. It cost 132,000, where the flow of the stream was combined with the, uh, you know, the sewer overflow. And so combining this does uh, res result in the uh, smell and the uh, you know, and bad weather, and, rain and wet weather. But you can see it was about eight feet high, the height of the workers. And this is what the uh, outlet looks today. However, there still is an overflow channel of Fern Hollow uh, Creek. So this is the uh, overflow culvert along the Fire Lane Trail and um, along the Nine Mile Run Trail. This is the, the uh, wooden bridge over the overflow. And next, I'm just going to mention the bridges at of the Nine Mile Run at Commercial Street because you know, because of their significance. So in 1907, so this would be the oldest bridge over nine over the Nine Mile run Fern Hollow area. Um, they constructed this arched culvert on, you can see them building uh, Commercial Avenue going up to Swiss Elm Park. Um, and in 1937, so when they built that culvert and they built that alignment, it pretty much ended around where the Irish Center is today. So that's the historic intersection with Forward Avenue. Today it's just one road, but back then it was an intersection. That part uh, going up the hill on Forward Avenue was not built until the 1930s, when it was um, Great Depression era WPA funding. However, they had so many delays and problems, as well as since they heard that the Parkway East was being planned, how would that impact the road? So they actually stopped work, which led to some washouts and led to some rework. So it wasn't until uh, 1941 that they ended up finishing. So for several years, this was known as the Lost Road of Squirrel Hill, and if you're a Squirrel Hill Historical Society member and get the newsletter, there's a great article about it. But anyway, so that's the culvert, and that's what one of the uh, washouts at that time looked like. And last bridge I'll talk about is the beautiful uh, Parkway East Commercial Avenue Viaduct. Here's an old drawing of what the bridge would like in the, look like in the 30s. Here's Commercial Street. Here's the parkway, and look at the interchange ramps. So you'd have an interchange there, and the park would, the uh, road was supposed to, instead of cutting straight through the hill like it does today, it would have been shifted closer into the Nine Mile Run Valley. And the park planning, um, you know, the landscape architecture firm 
worked with the engineers to reroute the road and make sure that the parkway uh, would be as minimally impactful of the park as possible. Um, the design team um, on the new bridge was George S. Richardson, who built everything from the Fort Pitt Bridge to um, all the way up to the Swickley Bridge, Glenwood Bridge. He was the main, you know, the most significant bridge engineer of the 20th century in Pittsburgh. Hoffman and Crumpton was the, were the consulting architects, and they were the legacy, ben, the legacy company that took over from Benno Jansen, who built a lot of buildings in the Oakland Civic Center, as well as the Washington Crossings Bridge. So construction occurred from 1948 to 1951, with 370-foot um, arches. Now consider, the new Fern Hollow Bridge spans are 150 feet, and these arches are 170 feet. So think about what could be done back then where you needed an arch, versus today where you can put up a simple beam. And interestingly, air-cooled slag was used as an aggregate. So building this bridge right by the slag dumps was a great opportunity for using that slag and a lot of the concrete in Pittsburgh, even the Greater Pittsburgh Airport, built at the same time as the bridge, used slag in the concrete. Now today the bridge is eligible for the National Register of Historic Places because it contributes to the historic Penn Lincoln Parkway East, a historic example of post-World War II um, urban planning, and it's individually eligible for its technical significance and aesthetic design. And let me get into the aesthetic design a little bit more. So here's what the, what the rendering of what the bridge was supposed to look like, with George S. Richardson's name and um, Hoffman and Crumpton. Now, Hoff, one of the buildings that Hoffman and Crumpton built locally was not Shadyside Presbyterian, but the chapel for Pres Shadyside Presbyterian. So these are some interior images of that chapel, which opened in 1952, so just right around the same time. And if you look under the arches, the transverse Gothic arches, I mean, it always feels like a cathedral underneath there. But understanding that that architecture firm, were, you know, they were building churches at the same time. And you can see the intentionality of that design. So the bridge was constructed from 48 to 52. And the way they did it was, you have, you, if you see this arch centering, so this, these uh, you know, triangular shapes under the arch, they build the, these metal triangular shapes and build the arch on top. Once the, you poured all the concrete up above, then you could slide the centering from one arch to the next. So you can see here's the next line of arches that are about to start. So this metal centering would be slid over, and you continue sliding it until you built the completed bridge. And once the bridge opened, it was promoted heavily. You know, beautiful, you know, beautiful, isn't it? Reinforced concrete. Um, made it possible. And reinforced concrete is concrete. Concrete is a material that works, it's basically rock glued together, so it works very well when you're compressing it, but if you start pulling it apart, it doesn't hold its strength, and that's why you reinforce it with rebar with steel. So that's what they mean by reinforced concrete, means it just has rebar in it. And then here's the Duquesne slag products, advertising the, the bridge. Um, you know, coating the concrete so it lasts longer, because con you know, um, Dora Plastic advertised with the bridge, and it's noticeable how much less that bridge has spalled than other concrete bridges um, you know, built at the same time. And originally there was this kind of, the seal is this like cable car on a track that went under the bridge for maintenance. And that was lasted until 1980 when they rehabilitated the bridge, but it was interesting that they even had this cable car system. Um, I don't know if anybody has any stories about uh, investigating it, but I'm sure that would be fun. So with that, it's the history of the bridges over Fern Hollow. I'm happy to entertain any questions um, about the history, and then we can get, get on to the modern, more modern topics. But any questions about the history of the valley? Yes? It's something simple, the name Fern Hollow, which I have to say, I had never heard of before the bridge fell, and anyone I've asked has never heard the name Fern Hollow. Does it go way back to... Uh... Yes, so the name Fern Hollow goes back to at least the 1800s. In fact, it was known as Fern Hollow before it was known as Frick Park. 
I did not find any any record of why it specifically was called Fern Hollow. I mean, we can imagine that it was a wooded hollow that probably had ferns. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense, but yes, but it is actually an older name than uh, Frick Park. Is Fern Hollow in Point Breeze? So that's a great question. So it depends on, the, you know, there are various city neighborhood lines, right? So part of it is, so the part of Fern Hollow that is in Point Breeze is mainly the part that was redeveloped and filled in. So like Wilkins is the line um, to Point Breeze, Wilkins to, um, so, so yeah, so part of it is, but mainly Fern Hollow is the border between Squirrel Hill and Regent Square. So it's not Point Breeze. Well, the Sarah Right, right. The Bowling Green. Right, so yeah, the Bowling Green end. So the, yes, the Bowling Green end. So the, so the, the very top of the valley before the, 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 you know, the very top of the valley, the start of Frick Park, would be Point Breeze, and then it becomes, you know, Squirrel Hill and Regent Square. So where the bridge is now, is that Point Breeze? So where the bridge is, is the border of Squirrel Hill and Regent Square. You know, Point Breeze. Yeah. I was told mm -hmm. it was Point Breeze. Well, uh, par it would be P Park Place, too, right? Or... Right, right. Mm -hmm. That whole Regent Square thing is just like... Yeah. We say yeah. Regent Square, but it, you know, it's like Swissvale, Edgewood, Park Place, right. it's all... Squirrel Hill. And as well as the city neighborhoods and sub neighborhoods and yeah. okay. names like Park Place, Regent Square, those are vague general mm -hmm. terms. There's no specific legal definition of where one is the same. Like yeah, eventually the city had went and defined neighborhood boundaries, but you raise a really good point that back then the neighborhood boundaries were not defined the way they are now. Do those earlier bridges have streetcar tracks in addition to uh, accommodating uh, automobile traffic? Yes, so some of the older bridges did. So in the case of Fern Hollow, the streetcar tracks were on the original Fern Hollow Bridge. They were not on the replacement. Most of the streetcar lines in the East End um, were, were converted to bus service in the 1950s and 1960s. In general, in Pittsburgh, when they built the interstate, streetcar ridership went down and it was converted with bus service. They never build an interstate in the South Hills, so we still have some streetcar service there. But otherwise, it's generally all bus service. This is off topic, but while I'm thinking of it, streetcars have rails. Correct. How do they get those across the railroad track? So that's, that's, an, that's an excellent question about how you would get streetcars across railroad tracks. And initially, they didn't, right? So initially, that was a big conflict, and like say for example, the original line across the Homestead High Level Bridge went to Homestead, and passengers would have to get out and walk across the tracks for the one the route along Eighth Avenue. Mm -hmm. Eventually, you you know you can configure like a you know a diamond or a perpendicular crossing, but the negotiations for that it did happen, but it was relatively rare, so it was pretty much encouraged to have grade separations, meaning put streetcars over rails. So did it happen? Yes, but as infrequently as the railroads would allow. So, so I'm just curious, like, when, when that portion of the Fern Hollow where the bridge is now, the, 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 the new bridge, was Frick uh, property, essentially. That's correct. And you, you would have had the cemetery had, had been uh, mm -hmm. established. The, do you think that people kind of sort of cut through the Frick property to get kind of over to Braddock Avenue there? Like, was there sort of like an informal path of sorts, I wonder? Or? I mean, I would assume so. I mean, when you look at the various maps, there are all kinds of different paper streets, like di dashed lines that, like, Biddle used to, say, go from there all the way through the river to Nine Mile Run. You see old maps where Forbes went to the creek and stopped. I mean, obviously, people were still going to make their way up the hill, so... I would certainly assume, and then you know, the older maps show Forbes winding up to Rosemary Road, so which again would have just been a path that there's no evidence that it was ever developed into an actual street. So yes, yeah, so people definitely you know would as much as just like you know would explore and find paths. So yeah. Okay, so with that um, we can go on to just 